I mean, really, at the end of the day, uh, disciples is where it's at, darling. <laughs> A disciples, a disciples of Christ is what we're called to be. Yes. And um, because there's one thing, I mean, the Bible says in the book of Acts that the disciples were called Christians. And um, you'll find even when you go to Christian meetings, there's a big difference between those who believe things about the Lord and those who are actually students of his word. So genuine disciples. Um, what what's some of the traits that you notice in disciples that you maybe didn't notice in yourself when you just first maybe became a believer? For um, Reverence and submission to authority. Okay, that's a huge one right there. Yeah. Huge one. Reverence and submission to author to authority. Anybody else? Just real genuine. Yeah, super duper genuine, definitely. I think that when you're a disciple, Rob is hitting the road all the time. <laughs> it's very hard to get a bit up there because you're constantly being, hey, 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 let's keep it real, let's keep it real. <laughs> yes, Mama. Um, not only do they reverence authority, but they understand how it works. Yeah, right. Yeah, they know um, yeah, that's good to give way. So true, Mum. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Good. yeah. I mean, Mum was just sharing about how Leighton uh, Baker is the leader of the New Conservative Party. Um, how, you know, say he might rock up to a meeting because uh, Mum and Dad are conveners. And, um, you know, he might rock up to a meeting but have a bit of a change of plans of how he wants to run the show or whatever. He's the boss. Yeah. <laughs> He's the leader of the party. He's the boss. So he might speak to, to Dad about it, Tom Hockley about it, and then so Tom will get up there and start doing the way Leighton said, but other people, even other candidates or other people in the party, they can't do that. No, no, you can't change things. No, no, I have to do things such and such a way. And, <laughs> and so then there's that conflict that starts happening when Leighton's wanting to go this way, but others are still wanting to go that way. Because again, great people, genuine believers maybe, but not practiced in discipleship. Yeah. So when you're a disciple of Christ, that means you're a student of the Word of God. You're an imitator of those who the Lord has set over you. And it, there's one word I'm looking for that's really, really distinctive about disciples. Humble? Yeah! Hey. I was going to say it starts with H. Yes. <laughs> one way I recognise a, a disciple um, quicker than any other is humility. It's, it's, the, it's like the defining trait of a disciple is um, they're just... They've got humility practiced in their life. Yeah. Not that it's any easier. <laughs> Not that our flesh doesn't still want to get up and excuse me. And I know a thing or two. Yeah. Um, that, that's in all of us. That's, yeah. that's in this flesh. But a disciple is practiced in mortifying the deeds of the flesh and saying, no, God has made you the boss over me. Yeah. Whether it's in our workplace with our employers, yeah. whether it's in a political party with who God has set up as, as the head there, whether it's in a family with a, a, a husband or a father, whether it's in a church with senior ministers, etc., etc. God is a God of order. He does because, um, you know, order, creativity and beauty, there is middle names. Like, yeah. that's how everything works. This world, this universe would not function without order. We would all be burnt to a crisp by the sun or frozen. You know, we, the animals, every, every, nothing would work. Your body would not be working right now if not for order. And yet somewhere along the line we get the idea that we can just toss it in our personal lives. And it's funny though as well because we'll be wanting to toss it in our marriages, order, right? But then we're terrified if there was no order in the country. Because if there weren't police to enforce law and order, who knows what could be happening? You know, or we want to toss order when it comes to our workplace. How dare the boss tell me this? Or, you know, in school, how dare the teachers, whatever. But again, when it comes to the country, we're desperate to have proper order because we don't want psychos <laughs> leaving the country. So we all know at our core that order is so, so important. And um, as Christians, what do we do? We submit to the order of God. So we read, we study his word, we see what his order is and his ways are. And that, the fact is, they just work. God's ways just work. That's all there is to it. And so we need to be studiers of the ways and the word of God. And we need to um, then be doers of the word. So we don't just hear about it and study it. We, we then go and do it. Amen.
So, yeah, so, but it is so encouraging. And I always just say to mum, I mean, at the end of the day, we need the country needs to be run by disciples. Yeah. That's the way to go. Yeah. So not even just people who say they believe in Christ, because the Bible says even Satan believes in, in the Lord. Yeah. And he trembles. Yeah. But he knows, because of course he, he knows he's real. So, um, but it's one thing to be a believer. It's another thing to be a student of the Lord and be submitted to him in our lives. Amen. So, praise God. Father, thank you so much for this day. Lord, it's such a joy and such a privilege to be here again. And uh, we just love your word. And we love being your daughters. We love knowing you, Father. And I just pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you'll keep us all warm and cozy. And uh, you'll also open our hearts. Um, and our minds to receive your word with all humility, Lord. I pray for breakthrough in every single one of us in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm kind of bummed you're not here, Chanel, because I really wanted you to share a bit of your testimony this week. Um, But next week when you're back. But Chanel has been sharing on our Marco Polo Women's Channel a little bit about what she's been experiencing. And it's been so lovely to see, darling. Um, Was that an anniversary? Is that what started? It's a happy anniversary to you, beautiful lady. So, um, Chanel and Robin, for their anniversary, headed down to Dunedin? Or, yeah, yeah. And with family down there, and, and it sounds like she's just been having the time of her life. <laughs> Being spoiled rotten, that's what we like to see. But um, you sow you reap, darlings. You sow you reap. So, sounds like you've been doing some pretty good sowing there, sis. So, beautiful to see, and we look forward to you sharing your testimony. But, um... Why I'd love her to be here this morning is just so encouraging hearing testimonies of what the Lord is able to do through those who will submit to his word. Like mum and I were just talking about a few examples. Talia, for instance. I mean, you know, it was only what, six months ago, you know, just before COVID that we were talking about with your husband. So Talia's husband was unsaved. Okay, so... When she was here doing the women's meetings last year and earlier this year, um, her husband was unsaved. So, um, and you know, I, I shared earlier in the year, I said to her, uh, oh, where's Indy? She's on the way. She's away as well. No, no, she's on the way. Oh, she's on the way. Praise the Lord. So for Indigit, Talia and Chanel, uh, three of our ladies and Tamara, you there, hey, baby? Yep. So Tamara's husband is a backslider. So he was with the Lord and then he had left the, he's left the Lord at a certain point. But that if we will continue in the word, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3, and I am an example of this. And in fact, one of the questions that's been sent through this morning from Kessid is on how did you go when your husband was unsaved? And, you know, you, you ladies have already heard a bit of that, but I'll share a little bit more and answer to Kessid's question. Um, but the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3 that we can win our husbands. Oh, yes. That's not manipulation. That's the Bible right there. Yes. 1 Peter 3 says we can win our husbands by our behavior. And the King James it uses the word conversation, which we know is the word lifestyle or behavior or your manner of living. So, so, so through our choices to obey the word and become the Kayil, self-controlled, feminine women of God that we are called to be, we can win our husbands to the Lord. And Talia is an amazing, amazing testimony. So, you know, about six months ago, we were saying, you know, he could be one. He could be one in a few months if you will do the word. Well, a few months we went into COVID-19 lockdown. We weren't even able to see each other. But come back from that and... Talia's husband is now born again. He has made a decision for Christ and he's bearing fruit of a genuine Christian. He's sharing with others, testifying. I believe Tal's even told me he might have even prayed for someone the other week. He's now reading the Bible, wanting to lead his family in the Lord. I mean, this is incredible. So, um, and this is a man that Tal's has known for what? Probably nearly 20 odd years since you guys, uh, guys were in school. And this year, he's come to know the Lord. Tal's has known the Lord for a lot of years now. Um, had a bit of waywardness there, but has come back and has now been steadfast in the word. And she, Talia, is reaping what she has sown. And uh, she has sown obedience to the word of God. And so, just an encouragement for yourself, Chanel, and for Tam, who's on, and Indy when she gets here. But I know all of you, I mean, what you were sharing, Chanel, 
this week even, your husband has never, you said, you've never been treated this way that you're being treated now. In fact, you know, you shared that you're feeling a little overwhelmed by it. And what are my words to you? Because I know you asked me what my words are. Um, babe, hey, babe, lap it up. <laughs> lap it up because I'm telling you, um, feeling overwhelmed by it. I mean, I'm overwhelmed by Jesus. I'm overwhelmed by my husband. I'm overwhelmed by my children. I mean, yeah. I arrive and they all stand in there to give yeah. me cuddles. And the first Even thing, all stuff. three of them are like, what can I do for you? That Fancy overwhelms stuff. me. Yeah. While I'm just going to the toilet, they're getting me a hot drink, setting up my mind. I didn't ask for any of that. I get overwhelmed every day the by the love that I receive from the Lord, from all of you. I mean, I'm walking around in my land, planting my maple trees yesterday, and I'm just like, God, oh, this is so beautiful. I'm just, everything's so beautiful. You're so beautiful. My husband is so beautiful. My children are so beautiful. My friends are so beautiful. Like, oh, it's just delicious. And he's like, well, that's what happens when, when you live to do the Word of God. So the Word of God, and when we place our trust in the Word of God, and we seek through the grace and strength of God to do the work. It doesn't matter where you start. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you start. Because if you think, it's easy for you to say, remember where we start. You just start somewhere. Yeah. Hey, Tals, just start somewhere, babe. She came back in, dragging her feet through the door. And we're like, right, let's begin where we're at, eh? You know, and there was addictions going on and strife going on and different things. But already so many, look what the Lord has done. So when she set her heart to go, no, this time I'm, I'm going for it with God. And um, yeah, so I know when Ryan and I came into a biblical ministry, our marriage was hanging on by a thread, literally by a thread. My husband had told me we have nothing in common anymore. It's like there were just demons standing right between Ryan and I all the time. It's like we couldn't even understand each other. So we'd try and talk, but it was just... It was just going like this all the time. We just could not see eye to eye. And there was so much tension and frustration. There was a lot of sickness in our family. Um, huge amounts of debt. Um, my husband had a major pornography addiction, as you know, as well as a gaming addiction. Um, but pornography was definitely the one lust. And his um, adulter adulterous behavior. It was just causing major, major issues in our family. But all of it was because I knew some things because I was born again and Ryan wasn't, but there was a lot of things I didn't know. Yeah. And uh, that I know, therefore, I was contributing to issues in our marriage. And certainly as a Christian, I was really only a babe. I'd been saved for 10 years, but because I'd never been discipled, I was still a babe. And um, so, so many things, I was very, very immature. And so I came into a biblical ministry and straight away had ministers who were like, right, let's do this. Woo! <laughs> and I just never had, you know, Dr. Jesus really at me, like it really slicing and dicing out all the cancers and it was terrifying. Um, but wonderful, wonderful. So he, you know, our ministers began to come after us in our marriage, began to come after us in our thinking, in our attitudes, in our finances, in our health, in our parenting, in every single area. And that's why I say humility is the defining characteristic of a disciple. Because anyone who doesn't begin to practice humility will not make it. You'll be out. You won't stand for having people tell you what to do. I'm an adult. Don't tell me what to do. I was like, fine. Keep going your own way then. But if you really, really want to learn, you come into anything. If I want to be a great chef, if I want to be great anything you've got to humble yourself and say well i'm starting here like i need to be taught and if that's how you come in with humility you will grow if i rock up to learn how to cook but i'm like, i already know how to do that and i already know how to do it, i'm not going to proceed so it takes humility to grow and that's what it takes in, in becoming a disciple of christ so first is the humility to actually commit yourself to a biblical church you know we all know that that um, seeking the Lord uh, to reveal a biblical church to you. What does that mean? A church who is genuinely trying to preach the unadulterated word of God to you and, uh, and striving to live out the word of God as best as they can. Of course, there's no church that's perfect, but you seek to find a biblical church and then you get in there. You understand that your flesh is not going to like a lot of what you're going to be told. Um, because that's the thing with the Word of God. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, which means it is going to come and it is going to begin to slice away anything that does not line up with the mind of Christ. The Word of God's going to come after it. So, um, and so your flesh is not going to enjoy that. 
It's not going to be easy being a disciple. Being a disciple is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and as you darlings have seen, we will get, like, at, at some point we'll have 100 people all just come in really quickly. But very quickly, the word of God will filter them out. And throughout the 10 years that we've been in New Zealand, we've had hundreds of people come in and hundreds of people go out. <laughs> and then there's the faithful few who always remain. So God always keeps the remnant, but really the remnant are always those who are prepared to humble themselves under the word. So discipleship is not for the faint of heart. Um, and those who would have marriages that are to be envied, you know, my uh, uh, whole series has been called The Envied Marriage, because that's what people always say to Ryan and I. I so envy your marriage. I'm jealous of your marriage. I want a marriage like that. Well, it's one thing to say. It's another thing. Do you want to do the word of God in your marriage? Because it's for everybody. The blessings of the word of God are for everybody who will seek to do them. Doers of the word. There's no favoritism with the Lord. There's no partiality with the Lord. And uh, if you'll do the word, you'll get the results of the word. So people are like, wow, your children are so amazing. Do the word. You know, your health is so amazing. Do the word. Your finances are, do the word. Um, you, you're reaping all the time. Yeah, well, that's because we've done the word and we've been sowers diligently in whatever area it might be. So, um, and that's something that Chanel, you were raising about how, you know, we've shared the scripture about, you know, cast your bread upon the waters and soon it'll be coming back on every wave. And Chanel was sharing about how now it's like it's just, coming back on every wave but at first you've got to cast your bread upon the waters yeah. so what does that mean you've got to start doing the word in that area you want children who reverence you and right now they're crazy little brats right well when Nadia first walked in so Nadia and Josh are another great example so Josh who stood up as a candidate now for the new conservative party and was such a great example last night stood up spoke so well um, was amazingly confident, just went for it, introduced his beautiful wife. Yeah, well, let me tell you about the first meeting they came up to. <laughs> Our family still lasts to this day. You know, they just walk in and it's like, <laughs> you know, doing their thing. Where's their sunglasses into the service? And, oh, that's you, that's you, to her husband all during the service. And Josh is just like, oh, shut up, shut up. And when they come to our meetings in uh, Te Aumutu, they'd sit at opposite sides of the wall, the room, all this. The whole time they'd be making sarcastic digs at each other. And just every every time you even mention Josh's name, Nadia's eyes would roll back into it. Just, oh. <laughs> about anything you'd say about him like um, they just basically detested each other I don't know how they <laughs> were still together and their children were just little ADHD psycho you know, bless their hearts and now they're one of the most amazing families you'll ever meet five children now I think when we met them they only had two they might have just had Kira she looked like a wee little golem when she was born yeah <laughs> She was this spindly little thing with a few straggly. <laughs> Hope you're not watching this. Oh, she is watching it. Gracious. <laughs> no, Kira's one of the cutest kids you'll ever see now. Their voices, mate, her and Paul's voice are amazing. Their little husky voices. But anyway, that family, what a testimony. Amazing. And again, um, Nadia is one of the most beautiful, submissive wives. And I don't mean as in she's silent and sits on her hands. I mean she's just joyful, girly, but in awe of her husband. She's gone from rolling her eyes back in her head at him to it's like she's in awe of him, which is the word of God. The, the word reverence means awe. It's that holy fear and that, wow, you're so amazing. It's like that's the way she thinks about him. How has she come so far? There has been, what does the scriptures say? Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And you might think, I despise my husband at this point. Well, if you get into the word of God and allow the word of God to wash your mind, because you're going to answer for that. Because that mind, that mindset, especially if you're in here and you call yourself a Christian, that mind is anti-Christ despising of our husbands and it doesn't matter as the Bible says if they're small or great that is irrelevant the Bible doesn't say and wives are to reverence their husbands if they're great men of God if they are following the Word of God if they're doing something important in this world if they're not idiots if they're no 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 it just says wives are to reverence their husbands and, and a few verses back it says and are to be obedient to their husbands in everything 
as the church is to Christ and it doesn't put clauses on yeah. if they are this and that. Now of course it does put a clause on we are not to obey our husbands or anybody for that matter who has authority if they are teaching us something that is against the word of God. But that doesn't mean we're to despise them but we are not to obey anything that is outside the word of God. But how do we do that? I mean, I've shared my testimony about how my husband one day just plainly asked me, you think I'm stupid, don't you? And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't say no. I really wanted to go, no. But I was like, I actually do. I actually do think you're stupid. That is so bad because I never would have said that. And I don't know where that happened. Because when I met him, I worshipped the ground that my husband worked on, walked on. I obviously physically was very attracted to him, but I would go around boasting about Ryan and say, he just does everything well. Like whatever he puts his hand to, he does it so well. And I just tell everybody, he's one of those people who just really annoy you because he's perfect at everything. And I, I literally was in awe and wonder of my husband for the first few years. Um, but he did begin to show that he was unsaved within three months of being born again. And that... Of being married. Of being married, sorry. Yeah, sorry, of being married, he began to show that he was not saved. Um, and then that got worse and worse. And within a year or two, I still was worshipping. You're so incredible. But I was now beginning to see more and more that he literally just wanted to have sex with anything and he could not could not focus on anything but sex um, and other women and anything anything that was debauched and perverse and I just I thought he was so magnificent and I, my mind was that he was so honorable and wonderful he was the oldest of 12 children he was raised in a Christian family he was such a hard worker and then Satan was wanting me to think about him as an animal that he was a pathetic, brainless animal who, yes, he could work, um, but that's just because he'd been trained. He was just like an animal. He was a dog. So he'd go to work, but then when he was at work, every second he got, he just wanted to look at pornography and start humping something. Like, that's basically where my mind had come to be about him. And when he wasn't doing that, he was entertaining himself with games. So I just thought, this guy is a numbskull. Like, that started happening. And with our children, um, obviously, Ryan wouldn't do anything. He went to work, he came home from work, and he wanted to look at pornography or play games. So he'd get angry at the kids if they stood in front of the TV, if he was trying to game. And it was just barely any interaction. That went on for nearly 10 years, um, where he started telling me he wanted to take me to swingers parties, and he, he wished that I would you know, have sex with other men, and that I would you know, take stodgy photos and send them around to people to turn him on, and just, it was just like messed up. And I'm like, born again and loving Jesus and trying to run the youth group and doing so many things and I'm like my husband's just you know um so when he asked me one day plainly do you think I'm stupid I was like I didn't say yes but I didn't say no and that's when I just realized wow the bible does not say to me that I am to reverence him if and my mind has gone so far from the word of God um no wonder I am definitely not helping him to get born again so I was trying to do nice things but that wasn't enough because you can be doing nice things but in here is what they're receiving they're receiving the spirit because what does the Bible actually say in 1 Peter 3 it's the spirit it's actually that meek and quiet spirit so yes the conversation which is the lifestyle the behavior is really doing something he's seeing it going wow but it stems from the spirit and if you're kind of doing the right things, but in your mind you're thinking, you stupid idiot. Like, I wish I'd married so-and-so. And during the church services, a man of God's up here preaching and going, oh, if only I'd married a man like that. Do you think your husband's not feeling that? Of course he is. Because we're spiritual beings, darlings. We're spiritual beings. And our husbands are receiving what is coming from our spirit. And so we can, the Bible says in Proverbs 14.1 that a, the foolish woman tears down her house with her own hands. And uh, I, I, I didn't realise it at the time, but my spirit was actually tearing Ryan down. So in answer to you, um, Kesson, and your question this morning, 
How did I go with an unsaved husband in terms of, you asked the question about, about believing for him and uh, speaking to him in the way the Bible would teach me. Well, that was it, that was it babe. That's really where it started. Is the Lord got a hold of me and said, you need to believe with me. And I've shared this testimony many a times, but I was like, believe what, Lord? Because what I'm seeing is screaming so loud in my senses, I was struggling to believe anything other than what I was seeing. Um, but the Lord said, believe with me. So I understood what he was saying was, you need to get in my mind about Ryan. And the Bible says that God is a God who calls those things that be not as though they were. God is outside of time. So he's seeing our husbands for who he's really called to be. Whereas we're seeing our husbands for what they may be right now and what Satan wants us to see. So that was the first thing, was getting a godly mindset about my husband and realising how God saw him. <clears throat> and the way God sees your husband is A, as his son. Your husband was called to be the son of God. Now, what does that mean? The God of all creation has created a son for himself <clears throat> and you get the privilege of being married to him. <laughs> this man is a son of God, which means he's honoured by God. He's respected by God. He's cherished by God. And dear God, you don't want to get on the wrong side of all of that. You want to make sure you're on the right side and you're with God in these things. Your husband is also called by God a king on the earth, a priest on the earth. He is called the boss of the earth. God made man first and gave him the earth to be the ruler over. God also made him the head when it comes to families, when it comes to us as women. God made our husbands our heads and you begin to understand these things and that God did not cause them by it so long as he's not acting like an idiot that just never comes up <laughs> in fact if anything it talks about in the scriptures if you have someone froward in your life which basically means evil wicked perverse messed up even then you know in those contexts when it speaks about frowardness and it, there's no specific one to husbands well there are some examples in Old Testament scriptures of women who are married to say a froward husband but the emphasis is still on what you do if you're married to someone froward it doesn't discount and say now you don't need to revere them it just the Word of God teaches us how we are to respond in those situations so we are still doing right before the Lord and even greater that we can actually see the froward completely turn around and become who they were really called to be in Christ. So the Lord told me to start thinking about Ryan the way he thinks about Ryan. And that takes faith. <laughs> because faith is believing in things that you don't see, really. It's having confidence in things that you don't see and ultimately in what God's word has to say. And um, so for me, uh, I begin, began to think about Ryan and it took, uh, it took practice. It took practice because when you've had years and years of thinking about your husband as an idiot, um, it's going to take a wee bit of practice to start constantly stirring up the thoughts of God about your husband. And you know what I really find helpful, ladies, and that's why I spend a lot of time teaching you about this, is teaching you how men tick. Because the more you understand how men tick, the more you love and adore them. Because you actually realize they're just different from you. If you judge a man according to the standards of a woman, you're going to be disappointed. You may as well go and marry yourself a woman. But you're never going to be satisfied and happy there because that's not the way God ordained it. Real satisfaction and fulfillment comes when we do things God's way. But when you understand that men are so different from you, you actually begin to really, really appreciate him. And uh, so I think that's a really key part of the renewing of the mind, is understanding, like what I shared last Saturday, um, uh, the language of men and how they tick, how they think, how they move, in contrast to the way that women do. When you come to understand that, I, I mean, who, who's found your heart going, being so softened? So it starts with being like, oh, and then it's moved from there to going, wow, you are so amazing. And then so much of those, you're such an idiot, you're such an idiot. You're just going, wow, you're such an idiot. Like, what were you thinking? Like, you're the complex one. You're the over-emotional one. You're the one reading into everything. Your husband's actually just trying to go down a straight path. And, and, and I can look at almost any relationship now and I 
I can just see, darling, why things aren't working. Yeah. Like, it's funny, it's funny, it's, but it's sad, but because um, I was going to say I wouldn't claim to be an expert, but actually, no, I would claim, I, I would claim to know everything, but I think an expert is someone who's been doing it for a while and got some pretty good consistent fruit, so I suppose in that sense, I'd certainly say I'm somebody who's committed to the journey of becoming an expert when it comes to the Word of God.